Hi everyone, it's Becky here. So right now I'm outside Columbia SkyTrain station uh, in New Westminster. So first of all, I'm gonna get a cup of coffee from this cafe down the bridge. So I got a breakfast wrap, cup of coffee, sketched it. And now it's time to have a little sketchy adventure here. It's just so nice to be out here after so many smoky days from the forest fire. The air is so fresh and cool again. And this video is going to be playing in real time speed because um, I attached my gooseneck tripod to the, to the edge of my sketchbook. If I speed it up, it's going to be too shaky for many people to watch. Uh, so I just decided to do another real time video. All right, so because the railing, uh, the, the bars of the railing is not suitable for attaching my gooseneck tripod and my other uh, standing tripod uh, can't bear too much wind. It's pretty windy right now. So I'm sitting down at the um, pedestrian's walking bridge, connecting the cityscape of New Westminster and the quayside. Uh, by the Fraser River. So now I'm taking about uh, a minute to visualize the size and placement of these important elements, like the, uh, the size of the, uh, the foliage here on the left. So I have um, a 180 degree view of the landscape in front of me. And here my sketchbook is um, only able to contain about 90 degree of it. So I'm being pretty selective. Um, I just want to include the foliage, but not the building on the very left side. And then um, the lens of the, um, the Port Man Bridge over here. This is the, the middle part of the bridge. And yeah, so this is one of the towers of, of the bridge connecting all of the suspenders or the wires to the body part of the bridge and continuing uh, the horizontal lens of the bridge towards the right. And now I'm seeing another tower on the uh, closer to the right side of the bridge and it's looking a little bit shorter compared to the one on this left because of perspective. Uh, things in the far distance are shifting away from us. They look shorter and narrower and smaller. And I just drew two quick slanting lines on uh, the right side of each tower over here just to get that part of thickness. And then uh, drawing this curving horizontal line here on the bottom, pretty much parallel to the one on top. And now I am drawing the bottom part of the tower sinking into the Fraser River. Um, yeah, trying to figure the shape out is a little bit tricky. So it's kind of like a three dimensional uh, diamond uh, with, um, with a pretty thin thickness. And trying to figure it out, there's actually um, a negative space in the middle, a hole for the traffic to go through. Just really taking my time, yeah, just slanting line on the left. And a little bit of small structures in between. It's very much like a, a bracket in the shape of a diamond. So this is the support uh, stump on the bottom of the bridge. A concrete little cylinder in the, um, in the water. And keep adding more layers of you know, the definition of thickness for this uh, bracket of a diamond shape for the tower here. Just taking my time to see and try to find out uh, the details. As you can see, sometimes I'm pretty slow and uh, there's no need to rush at all. In some areas of an urban sketch, I like to slow down just to make sure that I'm, I'm getting that um, essential line and shape right, um, rather than rushing. For small details, like the random texture of foliage, I speed up because it's very hard to tell right or wrong. We're adding details for a tree or bush. Okay, now keep um, stretching out the length of the bridge and then adding the, uh, the bracket area for this tower here on the right. As I mentioned before, it's looking a little smaller compared to the one on this left because of perspective. 
and the bridge is uh, kind of slanting slightly downwards towards the right because I'm looking at this bridge from from its left side from perspective not straight on and now I am adding another uh, parallel line on top of the uh, the thickness of the bridge and then these short vertical lines uh, to depict the railing of the bridge and um, some lamp posts in between several bars and now I am drawing these slanting suspenders going from the top all the way to to the middle bottom of the towers to the side of the bridge. I'm using slightly gentle uh, hand pressure because these are very much uh, wires and uh, really kind of eyeballing the angles they are going. And I see numerous triangles from big to small and drawing these suspenders is really giving this uh, bridge much more spirit other than those two towers and now I am seeing uh, those suspenders on the right side of this tower yeah it's almost like a um, mirror image or symmetry compared to the lines on the left yep in the, going in the same uh, direction angle but just um, in the mirror image and for this one here the triangle is looking a little smaller because of distance and perspective keep adding more of these slanting lines for this uh, tower closer to me and yeah so all of these lines they are in pretty evened out distances from each other just adding these on and uh, we're drawing lines that lead like these they don't have to be perfectly straight just try all your best the more you draw uh, the better you're at drawing those, uh, those straight lines but as always, uh, my hand is not perfect. If it's bending a little bit, I don't mind that. It just kind of adds a lively spirit to my sketches. So I'm always embracing uh, my imperfections and, and mistakes. A lot of times I try to hide my mistakes. So a lot of people don't, don't know uh, what happened. And I keep adding these slanting lines. As you can see, this triangle here is much smaller compared to the one on this left because of perspective and distance. It's more far away from me. So now I am slowing down again to see the layers of details underneath the length of the bridge. So I see some more concrete or, met or metallic structures, another tiny little um, trapezoid, another layer of metallic structure so this bridge is super sturdy for uh, for cars trucks and the sky train is going through this bridge too yeah and the vertical support adding the uh, the foliage behind on the other side of the bridge accentuate the very bottom of the length of the bridge and one of the supporting legs bit more accentuation so the bridge lens it looks uh, stronger with this thicker line all right so the portman bridge is very much done now I'm ready to add more details on the left side of my sketch so now I'm drawing these electricity poles and the wires and all the electricity boxes on top and these um, electricity wires in between these two poles I love drawing these lines because they kind of echo with the uh, suspenders of the bridge and also giving a strong sense of streetscape perspective now moving on to this large uh, cluster of trees I'm using these curving and squiggly lines very similar to drawing puffy clouds yep curving again and again to give a sense of layers of trees over each other okay so now this line that I'm trying to define the top of the uh, the trees here in the middle ground is pr very important as you can see these trees are going slightly downwards towards the left following the perspective and adding some more little details I'm trying to draw this sky train 
passing the tower of the bridge here. Yeah, the shape is looking very abstract. The sky train is looking so small um, compared to the proportion of the bridge and the windows on the sky train. All right, and just accentuate the train a little bit so it pops out a little better from the middle of the bridge. Okay, adding some another thicker line for the length of the bridge there. Now coming back to the left side to finish uh, these electricity poles, uh, they look closer and closer far into the distance because of perspective. Uh, things they look smaller and um, foreshortened, the distances uh, shrink as well. Um, now I'm drawing this um, kiln shaped tree here in the foreground and there's another one overlapping on top of it. Yeah, so drawing trees is always a really relaxing experience. It's very hard to find, I mean, it's pretty much impossible to find two trees, even of the same species, looking exactly the same. And here I am actually summarizing the outline of these trees. So I am barely looking at the paper and just um, looking at these trees right in front of me down the pedestrian's bridge and just move my hand following my observation and sensation. I'm trying to capture the energy, the spirit of these trees, not just the, uh, the physical likeness, like a photo, and expanding uh, this cluster of trees a little bit more, connecting that with the foreground trees contour outline, finishing uh, the streetscape over here, which is really small but interesting leading the viewer into the big view of Portman Bridge and the river. I think we have a little one point perspective here. All of these lines from the um, electricity wires to the top of those trees, they're all coming down, trying to merge into a vanishing point. And trying to slow down and add some little bits of details and accentuations. For the, for the trees. Now I am also seeing and slowing down, trying to find the next essential line. Yeah, the bottom of that tower there on the right. Yeah, so there is another smaller bridge behind the Portman Bridge and it's called the, the Petalo Bridge. It has a really cute um, golden orangey color. So just drawing the lengths of the bridge. Again, it's slanting a little bit because I'm looking at these bridges from an angle, not straight on. And, um, and the, uh, the trees on the other side of the bank of the Fraser River. Yeah, so a lot of lines I'm drawing uh, might be looking kind of abstract and it only kind of makes sense to me. That's okay. If you're drawing with me of the same little landscape over here, we will end up with different line definitions for these elements. And now adding some more puffy little trees on the other side of the Fraser River. Okay, and now I'm ready to draw actually the very bottom of the um, Petalu Bridge railing. I'm actually making a little mistake over here and trying to fix it. Okay, this is uh, the arc shape of the uh, Petalos Bridge. And it's another uh, classical design of metallic bridges. So in an arch shape with a lot of uh, railings in uh, triangles. Okay, just getting that nice curve on top done. And then trying to make sense in the middle. So a lot of short foreshortened railing lines inside the arch shape. Yeah, so I see a lot of um, very foreshortened triangles. The two um, curves of the arch arch is almost overlapping each other from my from this perspective. Okay, 
Now it's time to move on to, to this part, the length of the bridge, drawing the, uh, the bars horizontally. And it's being supported by numerous vertical bars. And in between each vertical bar, we have slanting lines to form triangles. Again, this is a very classical design of bridge. And now I am continuing to draw uh, the railing details for the bridge behind here is right side again these repeating short vertical lines of the uh, little bars and then these slanting lines forming little triangles accentuate the bottom to give the metallic structure a bit more weight same for the bottom of the arch with accentuation and now it's time to pause a little bit, seeing and finding the next important line to add on. Yeah, so this is one of the bases for, for the bridge, the concrete structure here on the very bottom. So when I'm drawing uh, very detailed urban structures, like the bridges, like these ones, I focus on uh, the bare essence, like the, the metallic structure, the beautiful geometric pattern horizontally, and making sure that each of these uh, bridges, they have the, uh, the supporting legs on the bottom of the metallic structure. So once I captured the important, the essential details of these bridges and other objects, in the world, right? So kind of talking about more than just sketching these bridges and the urban structures. Once I capture the, the bare essential lines, I'm gonna stop and not stress too much about other lines that's out there because we could spend eight hours drawing this urban scenery um, and only spend like 45 minutes to do the drawing and watercolors. So it's all about finding uh, the most defining details for these structures. A lot of horizontal lines to connect and overlap. And uh, apparently, I think there is another bridge in the distance. So here I'm working through three layers of bridges. Each one is getting smaller because the objects in the far distance, uh, they just get smaller and smaller and accentuate the bottom of this bridge over here. So the Fraser River has um, several bridges to connect the different parts of Greater Vancouver. It's easy for, easier for people to, to commute around town. So these bridges are giving so much convenience for people uh, to travel around the Greater Vancouver area. Without the bridges, um, it, it could take like three hours uh, for us living in the suburban area to reach downtown Vancouver. And with these bridges, it, it would just take 40 minutes maximum to get to downtown Vancouver. So that's the difference between having or not having these bridges. Now I just added a little accentuation and some more supporting super foreshortened railings on the bottom of this Portman Bridge. Those dots that I added on, it's actually extremely short, to, uh, extremely foreshortened metallic bars on the bottom of the, of the bridge length. And using very gentle hand pressure to draw the ripples under the uh, concrete stump, the support of the Portman Bridge. And now I'm tracing over some of the lines already done. Uh, mostly for the bottom uh, support structures of these bridges. Um, so these bridges, they look more heavyweighted. Now tracing this area behind my cup of coffee. This is the other side of the Fraser River covered in foliage. Okay, so now I want to draw two seagulls flying by 
in the sky. It added a really nice sense of movement and a little bit of drama for this uh, little landscape. And adding some details, the squiggly lines for the texture of these trees. So if you're using a fountain pen, especially a fountain pen with a bent knit to draw, you could control your hand pressure and the angle holding that fountain pen to create very interesting organic lines of various thicknesses. So here I'm playing with the angle, my hand pressure. So the outline of this, uh, these foliage shapes are, I, I feel like they're much more interesting uh, than drawn with um, a fine liner pen a modern fine liner pen and keep having fun scribbling uh, the textures out for these trees and making the lines heavier around the overlapping areas. When you're adding details for your trees, bushes or shrubs, um, you might want to accentuate the outline a little stronger, especially on that overlapping area. One tree on top of another in front of another. And now I want to just accentuate the bridge a little bit more. There's a crayon or something behind. And I want to keep, I want to keep the negative space behind, uh, underneath the arch shapes of those bridges nice and clean without doing too many lines. So I'm actually eliminating a lot of lines that I found to be kind of messy to add on to. And coming back to these trees here in the foreground, adding these uh, very dominant folds of leaves. And accentuate the tip of this tree a little bit better. And now I'm looking uh, at the cloud form in the sky and try to remember the shape rather than copying. Um, a lot of times I like to remember uh, the form, the, the, the spirit of clouds rather than trying to copy them exactly because especially on a windy day, uh, clouds, they change shape like every 30 seconds. Depending on the wind, they could change shape like every 10 seconds. Just drawing these very delicate folds of the clouds, random but beautiful puffs of organic uh, clusters. And yeah, so by the way, as you can see, I flipped my fountain pen to the other side. So I get in these much thinner lines compared to using uh, the fountain pen the regular way. Yeah, some more folds of clouds in between the bridge shapes. It's such a beautiful day and the air is very refreshing. So we had um, about a week of smoky days due to the forest fire around the, uh, the inner part of, of British Columbia and also down south in the United States. Feels like a brand new world again with a fresh new sky coming back. And again, using thin lines to get the ripples of the water done. So here is a look of my finished line drawing. It took me about 22 minutes to draw. Now I'm ready. I'm so inspired to paint the sky. I'm gonna organize my palette over here. So I'm currently using the Mongyo brand watercolors. I also added a few colors from my old Etcher watercolor box. As always, I'm beginning the landscape painting with a sky area. So just wetting uh, the overall sky area was clear water because the paper is cold pressed. It had a bit of texture and um, I don't want any dry brushing stuff to happen for the sky. So just wetting it first allows the paint to flow very smoothly without any dry brushing marks. Starting from the top of the sky, um, using a diluted version of cerulean blue, Yeah, as you can see, wetting the, uh, the paper with clear water first, it really helps to show the uh, semi-transparent quality of the sky. Most of the time I'm using horizontal brush marks following the flow of air. Yeah, some more cerulean blue. 
play with water control too, so every single brushstroke is of a different value or tone of the cerulean blue. The sky is never perfectly even of the same hue of blue. Yeah, and also painting in between the gaps of the cloud over here. And this painting process is in real time speed as well. Okay, so now I'm grabbing a bit of lemon yellow diluted with a lot of water to paint this mellow yellow tint on the cloud on a bright sunny day. You know, sometimes I sense the cloud is not perfectly uh, white puffs floating in the sky. They're, they're catching a bit of yellow stain from the warm sunshine. Now I'm ready to do wet onto wet and mix cobalt blue with a bit of royal purple. So I get this um, very interesting muted uh, purple. Starting to add these little thick and choppy brush strokes on the bottom part of these clusters of clouds. Diluting it a little bit for the middle part and just let it merge with the yellow very loosely. And I mix the cobalt blue and royal purple right in the leftover green area. So that's why the purple is muted. A really nice color to shade clouds. For me, with, uh, with an artist's eye, I don't see clouds as, you know, as a dead gray by mixing water into black. Most of the time I see them as a bluish and uh, dark violetish kind of gray mixing more or less royal purple into the cobalt blue to get a slight different tone of lively gray. I'm also controlling my hand pressure and the angle holding the brush. So I end up with um, various interesting brush strokes to shade these clouds. Here for the bottom, I'm mixing a uh, higher ratio of cobalt blue over here, the bottom of the, uh, the very bottom of the, of the clouds. I see an organic blue and the nice green, this is hooker's green mix in. For the mountains in the distance, blending with the clouds. So yeah, in some parts of the, the landscape, especially those areas in the far distance, it could have a mysterious or a very subtle look. So here it is in the distance, I see um, mountains and it's blending very softly with the bottom of the clouds. It's a beautiful sight. Okay, so now I wanna go back to the higher part of the sky. While I was painting the bottom area of the sky, the higher area that I painted before is becoming moist. Before that, it was too wet to add any strong contrast like this. I'm punching on right now. So this is the same recipe as before. Um, cobalt blue with a tiny bit of cerulean for a slight higher saturation. Yeah, these are beautiful and lively clouds, more than just gray. The beautiful blue hue. And usually the higher part of the clouds, the shaded areas, it look a little more mild compared to the bottom. Here I'm just using the residue of the bluish gray on my brush to spread it around the top part of the clouds there. Quick little dashes and mixing some more bluish gray, a little bit more contrast for this little tuft of cloud drifting on the higher right. Again, I don't mind the shapes of, of brush strokes. They add a nice sense of movement for these clouds. And painting skies with beautiful clouds or charming colors in the early morning or in the evening. It's one of my favorite subject matters to paint because I could feel that I can be um, so expressive. There's no right or wrong. You don't have to match um, the reality in front of you or if you're working from photos, you don't have to be the same as photos. 
there's something different from working with acrylics or oils. Um, you, you are controlling um, the watercolors, but also at the same time, you are letting go and let the blooming happening very naturally. Let gravity do the work to pull the shades of colors together. So now I just wetted the Fraser River area with clear water. Putting on this diluted hooker's green and also a bit of leftover cerulean blue. Diluted with quite a lot of water. Yeah, this is the color of the river that I see right now on a sunny day. It's gonna have a very different um, color scheme on an overcast day in winter. And when you're sketching uh, the surface of water, even though it might look so grayish, um, you could use your artist license to spice up the saturation a little bit, all right? So usually the color of water, even though if it looks gray, it's actually a very deep and muted blue or green or a blend of these two. Now I'm punching on a bit more concentrated blue turquoise for the, uh, for the vague form of the mountain there in the distance. Pausing a little bit to see the next step that I need to take. So this real-time uh, process video is really helping you to see uh, the reality of my sketching situation. Okay, so my next step is to uh, paint the first and second layer of these foliage and the uh, foreground and middle ground. Just wetting those areas with clear water first. So this warm yellow that ties up these foliage and the streetscape together very nicely. And um, yeah, so this yellow is a blend of yellow ochre and lemon yellow. Now I'm doing wet onto wet, blending lime green with yellow ochre for the top of these trees. So now it's late summer. Uh, the trees are changing color a little bit now. That's why I'm mixing uh, yellow ochre into lime green and not lemon yellow. Otherwise, it looks too bright spring green. And also blending on a bit of um, lime green, slightly diluted version, some more yellow ochre, blending on top. So my color scheme for foliage is changing from season to season. As you can see, I'm punching even more yellow ochre for the, for the tips of these trees because it's almost autumn, my favorite season. I can't wait to capture the vibrant, colorful trees in my neighborhood and also around town. And punching on some more lime green to blend these beautiful, fancy colors together. And that's very much it. The lightest tones of greens and um, yellow oranges for these trees. When we're painting very much everything in the world, it's always a good idea when you're painting with watercolors to start with the lightest tone, to build up the contrast gradually through layering. And now I'm blending on hooker's green using these boat and thick brushstrokes, leaving some areas of that previous layer of yellow, yellow, green unpainted so these trees could shine yeah, it's a bright sunny day, so the contrast on these leafy greens um, is pretty high. Keep punching on some more hookers green. Yeah, which is kind of a funny name for a green. I think hookers, uh, the, the name hooker is actually the last name of someone famous. Okay, and um, reloading my brush with some more dense hooker green. So I'm constantly recharging my brush tip with juicy and concentrated paint after a few brush strokes. So you're not just using the residue and diluting that color by continuing on. You need to reload your brush with more juicy and saturated and strong paint pigment. But that's not always the rule. As you can see now, I'm using the residue 
of hooker screen on my brush tip to rub it on on certain areas of those foliage there on the right. So it really depending on your observation and your sensation, you may or may not need to reload your brush. There's no strict rules about what you should do. You should just follow your personal sensations and make your own personal choices about what to do. All right, so now I'm gonna leave those foliage colors a little longer for them to dry. Now it's time to paint um, the color of the concrete structures of the bridges. So this is um, burnt sienna mixed with a bit of raw umber, diluted with a lot of water. So this is the color of the concrete, uh, aged concrete. And it has um, a diluted sepia tone. And same for the lens of the bridge, using thin brush strokes of my medium tip water brush. Same for this um, tower of the bridge. So the effect of a warm sunny day, the, lumino the luminosity from the sunshine could change uh, the colors, the, the tones or values, and also the saturation of objects very differently compared to a rainy day or an overcast day. So now I see a lot of warm and happy colors even on the cold colored concrete bridges. Adding a bit of burnt sienna for the top of the tree there. Gradually shading the bottom of these trees here in the middle and foreground with a little bit of burnt sienna. And grabbing a bit of burnt sienna, mix it with a bit of orange to paint these thin railings um, of the uh, Petaloo Bridge there in the, um, in the distance. It's a really pretty bridge and I really wish to see it um, in full view, maybe from a different park in New Westminster. So I still need to look that up and um, perhaps one day I'll do a better sketch of that nice Petaloo bridge there that I just painted. Putting a bit of sepia for some of those bars um, because they're always shaded areas, even on very thin spaces. and leaving some bright, almost white streaks unpainted for the highlights of those metallic structures in the distance. And just being a little precise here, just using the few hair on my medium tip water brush to get those little details done. Punching on a bit of um, hooker screen for those distant trees and as well as here to depict the feel of clusters. Now I'm starting to add the texture for the surface of the Fraser River using a more concentrated um, green turquoise. So you can make your own green turquoise by mixing let's say hooker's green or any dark shade of green with cobalt blue, a higher ratio of green to get a uh, more greenish turquoise using very thin brush strokes, just a few hair on the tip of my brush to get these segments of thin brush strokes done. The stumps on the base of the bridges have a bit of reflection and a bit behind the handle of my cup of coffee here, a bit of gentle ripples. Yeah, so this is how we paint the surface of water in simple, in a simple technique. So you need um, a very watery first layer of blue uh, turquoise or green turquoise, depending on the situation affected by uh, natural elements like the sunshine, the weather, and the season. And then you lay on a more concentrated um, value of uh, blue or green turquoise brushstrokes. Okay, I think that's very much it for the surface of water. Now I'm moving on to the back area just to, for some very minimal amount of renderings. Now it's time to shade the foreground trees even further. As you can see, I'm mixing burnt sienna with hooker's green. 
using my less watery water brush, the medium tip Hobain water brush, and using squiggly brush marks, merging many of the brush marks together so I don't have harsh, um, harsh edges. Yeah, just right above the, uh, the boundary line between one tree and another is the most intensely shaded area. And mixing even more burnt sienna into hooker's green to further intensify the value of green. Yeah, so I love mixing my shades of green by mixing more and more burnt sienna into hooker's green. And the shade color is very organic looking. For some extremely shaded areas, um, I'm mixing in cobalt blue into the shaded green leftovers. Yeah, just on the very bottom of this tree here. So these brush strokes that I'm adding on right now, um, I think the technique is wet onto moist or wet onto almost dry. My brush stroke is not fading out because the previous layer is uh, very close to dry. It really depends on what kind of effect you want. You might want to do wet onto wet or wet onto moist or wet on completely dry. Um, for crisper um, details like the ripples on the surface of water and for sharper definitions of leaves on trees, you might want to wait a little longer before uh, shading those areas or adding detailed renderings of textures. Just putting on a bit of uh, blue to shade the towers of the, of the bridge. So it looked even more like concrete. All right, just a quick dash for the distant mountain over there. I need to keep adding more weight for the foreground trees. Yeah, just pause a little bit and um, do some a little mindless renderings over there. Okay, and now I'm just grabbing this leftover shade of green. Be bold and expressive, adding these small and choppy brush strokes, like little thick dots, and merging some of them together so they, they're not harshly separated from each other. So these trees in the foreground and in the middle ground, I think it's really nice, uh, a framing element for this landscape. If I just sketch the bridges, the sky and the water, the weight of this uh, landscape painting is gonna be too light. And so I think it's, it's wise to include these trees as framing borders on the bottom and also on the left side. So putting on brush strokes like these is very similar to uh, writing calligraphy. So you need to inject a sense of um, energy and the power of nature onto these marks rather than just making random dots. So every, um, every brush stroke I'm making right now is of a different mark. They're not you know, uh, repetitions of that same dot mechanically. There are a lot of um, sensations and personal expressions I'm trying to inject into these brush marks. And then adding some little bit of reflection on the edge of the land there on the other side of the river. So in the last 30 seconds or so, I am adding final bits of renderings. These brush marks are almost invisible. So overall, this sketching experience has been really enjoyable. My, um, I'm pretty comfortable sitting on the warm uh, walkway here and getting this done in about um, 45 minutes. It's very quiet. There's actually nobody uh, passing by. So I don't need to worry about people looking over my shoulders. So that's very much it of my sketch. Thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. So now I'm taking my walk uh, down, the pe down the pedestrian's walking bridge to the quayside. And I did another quick sketch in about 30 minutes 
of the Fraser River close up and the land on the other side. And I will see you again very soon next time. I'm trying to upload a video every two to three days. I've been filming and editing a lot of these videos. I'll see you around very soon. Bye everyone, enjoy your day.